1992, Robin Jacobs of Fogbank Industrial Arts engineered and built a 1 to 24 scale working model of one of the Queen Mary's Yarrow water tube boilers. Built from the original blueprint supplied by Yarrow and Company Limited, Glasgow, the model was constructed from hundreds of pieces of aluminum, brass, and copper, all machined and fitted by hand. Features 477 water tubes, working oil burners, valves, lights, working superheater, and superheater damper. The model actually burns a mixture of bunker C-grade crude oil and kerosene and develops nearly 20 pounds of steam pressure. You've got smoke coming from the back of the furnace and the forward end of the furnace and it's controlled, the temperature is controlled by the superheat damper. The more smoke and, and uh, hot gases coming from the furnace, the more uh, bypasses the superheater, the lower the temperature is. So if they close the superheat damper on this side, that causes the uh, smoke and gases to be bypassed the superheater and come from the uh, rear of the boiler. The more they open this, the more uh, gases and stuff pass through the superheater tubes and bring the temperature up so they can control it very carefully through maneuvering the superheat dampers and uh, for instance, uh, totally shut down they always had at least one boiler going and they'd be uh, they'd shut down the other boilers and they'd be uh, some cleaning and stuff yes 30 of these yeah 24 of these you know. and of course I have a lot of things on here that weren't originally on the boiler such as little valves actually back out. You can actually smell the, the fuel and I've got my switchboards back here for firing it and for controlling the lights and doing all the... it's a little bit of a mess at the moment but uh, it's a... Uh, this it's tank here... This, this is a... Uh, this tank wasn't originally a part of this model and I added this on to show people the great height yeah. Uh, when you take a tour down, you walk on top of the, the uh, double bottom, but all this is honeycombed with uh, hundreds of watertight compartments, and uh, it's just amazing there to get in there and have access. And you have, you can have, yeah. There's access in through these manholes. You'll see, there's a, excuse me, a manhole right here. There's one up over here. They're all around. There's uh, probably some at the rear here too. But there's manholes inside here. See a manhole right here? Mm -hmm. Inside the tank. That's how you get inside uh, the tanks. And you see there's there's several different types of tanks. There's a settling tank, an oil fuel tank, and an overflow tank. And what the settling tank does, it's the only tanks that are heated. And there's two per boiler room. So there's a total of, uh, uh, you know, two in each, each compartment. And they're heated by steam. You'll notice some of these pipes and lines that are insulated with, uh, with special insulation uh, supply uh, steam is let off through different uh, reducing valves from the boiler rooms and led into heating coils in the bottom of the tanks and they maintain about 110 degrees temperature on those tanks and the reason they heat the tanks is because the fuel is so thick the viscosity is so heavy it's almost like the consistency of honey and they have to heat it before it can be pumped because it's too thick. And then it has to be heated again uh, before it can be atomized and then pressurized into the main oil field. Because I was noticing when I was walking through, there's all sorts of bits of machinery in there that are still left. Yeah, there's a couple of Centrix ballast pumps and that yeah. sort of thing that's, that's left there. That's what we want. But this unit was used to heat the fuel up uh, after it had come from the tanks. It goes through a set of strainers, duplex strainers, uh, similar to the ones that they have in the after engine room now, uh, auto clean oil strainers, and they were a cartridge type strainer.
all bronze. And yeah, they open they and close. They changed those, didn't they? Yeah, they're, those are, they're not even there anymore. But you, if you look, you can see where the uh, hinges and stuff were in the decks. But um, incredible. You can see this actually works. In the capsules shows you how they would work and how the roller fairly. They use these when they bring the ship into port. You know, they take up the slack and the hawsers and the lines. They run their lines out through these lower The anchors areas. work eventually when you've done it. Yeah, they actually actually work now. Yeah, so I open these up. And you can see how this is a break for the anchor. Mm -hmm. See, when you turn this, a little universal turns there. And when you, when they would be ready to release the anchor, they would have the brake on, and they would, the uh, gentleman would stand on what they call a wildcat platform, you know. Deck hand would stand on either side of this and have his hand on this big hand wheel. And as you see, when I move these big dogs that go in these pockets, actually move in and out. You can see how they move. You can see on both sides they actually move. So when they bring them in all the way, this is released. This door is opened up to the chain hatch, and the chain is actually let go all the way out. And as they pay out the cable. Uh, they ring a bell for every 15 fathoms of chain that's let out, they ring a bell once. And then when they want to bring the chain in, they would just repeat the process. And after the, you can feel, there's no tension there now, but you can feel the tension when they start to tighten this. You can feel, okay. Take and move your hand on that like that, and I'll show you what I mean. Just, just turn it back and forth. Just keep doing that for a minute. And when I tighten this brake up, you can feel, feel it. Yeah. yeah, there's actually a brake in there that actually yeah. works. So when you back this off, it's incredible. You can release that tension on there and bring that out. So I'm when they want to, that like they just yes. like, a, like a, a ramp over it. They? Well, I tried to get them interested in, in painting it back to the original color of sandblasting. These are still bronze. They just really? painted it over. And uh, I took one that was in storage that they removed, you know, off the stern of the ship. There was yeah. capstans there they removed and picked a bunch of the paint off, and you could still see the bronze under there. So they sandblast Oh, that'd be beautiful. I think it's a, all the whelps on the capstans were that way. See, these are all metal. I machined these all out of metal on the lathe. I have a separate blueprint that I used from Napier Brothers. That built. So all the shaft, all these little. Uh, shoulders on the shaft, the taper, all that's correct to the original design. You can see down in how they had a uh, the and shaft. The brass tops off it and they right, the covers are, and yeah, some of these are just in storage. Yeah. And they had a, a single bolt, the, the uh, shaft was on a taper, the, the uh, capstan drum itself was bored with the taper on the inside and had a big key to keep it from turning and that's how the, uh, they were originally appeared. And so you got any other models these? No, well, I've got the big 22 foot, I mean, it's not here. <laughs> really? Go yes, on. 22 foot model. I got some pictures of it, I'll show you. When this white link uh, mark lines up on the uh, siding on the bridge wing, they know from up there that the anchor is yeah. all the way up. And you'll notice these little pilot lamps. I'll show you how this all stuff here. You wanna dark. They have a deck hand standing at each position where these pilot lamps were. And each one of these control pedestals control the capstan. There was one here. This one isn't burning at the moment. But this, the, these two after control pedestals controlled the movement of these two capstans. And uh, these two forward sets were slaves. They controlled the capstan for the anchor, and they also controlled for the warping. So they were dual purpose. And uh, they would receive their orders from the ships from the telegraphs you see up here on the forward end. <laughs> And they'd be illuminated, and they'd see Are you their. The guys in the well, they've got a little scratched at the moment, so the but the wording is actually there. If you can look close enough, it, you need a magnifying glass, but the words are actually on. Oh, there I can't actually order. see. Yeah, look at that. And, uh, I like and then they would receive their orders. This is what they call a Marconi speaker, and there's you can see the forks on the port and starboard side. They're still there today, and uh, but that's what they originally would have held as a portable speaker, and it's a watertight. Uh, connection that was made uh, through the ship's uh, it's a shame we can't really get up here now, isn't it? Yes. You can, but...
this little guy was there. Like, or not. Yeah, there we yeah, go. It's knocking out, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's on there. Heavy strain on cable. You can see he would signal a tugboat. Oh, wow, it's on How fast do you guys are on to me? And I got the vents that work through. Slug away. I see when I plug these two after vents, mushroom vents up. You can hear the forward one working. Oh yeah. Let go stop. And these had jack screws on them where they could raise and lower the vents during bad weather. You can see how they would screw up and down. They could close them. Then after they were docked, they would shut the you know uh, they would shut the telegraphs off. And they'd have just the working, normal working lights on. This would be all that would be lit when the ship was in port at night. And then back here you have the stores hat. And you can see how they had a purchase, Manila purchase, that was used. You can see, if you go out on deck, you can see where these little islets were, where they'd run the purchases to, to steady this. Now this is gone now. During the war they had large... Uh, they had large uh, gun turrets, and uh, in order to to uh, to put the gun turrets there, it made it impossible to use this davit. So this davit was removed. All that's left is the pillar. So if you go out there, you'll see the davit's been cut at this point where this black starts, or where the white starts, and then the black meets the, the white. So they never they start. No. What they did is they put a stirrup at the uh, main jack stay line coming down from the mast. There's a line that runs up from the knight's head. Oh, should we just, uh... Yeah, I have a big machine shop that I do this stuff with. This stuff was originally casting, you know, when they made the real ship. Of course, this one isn't completed on the port side, but you can see how I just machine it out. This part was turned on the lathe, made round, and this part was done just boring it and just doing it by hand. I have a machine that makes a little rivets, you know, for the bumps. 36 on a side. If we can count them out there, there's 36. <laughs> then when I, you know, basically have it sort of a sloppy fit so I can adjust it just where I want it. Once it's adjusted, then I, I plank around it and it's, you know, That's it. it's exactly where it needs to be. And this, this part of a mistake here, you can see I something happened and I had to add a little weld on the, uh, on this here. And then once I once I blend it, this part here was welded, but you can never tell. Once it's all remachined and blended in, you can never tell. So if you gouge it and make a mistake, fill it up with weld, you know, uh, a heliarch we use uh, to, to weld it with. And uh, you can see how this is just a separate piece, how they fit together, machined. And then they have little hinges on them. And once it's all painted, you know, there's still these and the, and the roller fairly. If you look closely, you have to look really close, there's cotter pins on the little nuts. And the gag pins on the uh, roller fair leads. I had this guy, uh, believe it or not, his cigarette lights up. You see, it's got a. No, see the little light? Or the little. See, he's got a little cigarette sticking out of his mouth. But, uh, God. and it's a, uh, what is it? It's a, uh, op uh fiber optic I use. I this one's where it's hand makes that. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, I'll have these eventually animated with motors, you know, with a little uh, crankshaft and this type of motion. And it's simple. It's really not that difficult to do that sort of thing. It's just, uh, 